certainly want to welcome each and every one of you. You could have been doing other things this afternoon, but you'll find that this is a good investment in your time. Uh, how many of you have ever heard me speak live before? Live before. How many of you have ever heard of one of my tapes? Okay, great. And you're still with us. That's very good. <laughs> okay, well, let me uh, bring everybody else up to speed here. My name is Dr. Joel Wallach, and uh, I grew up on a farm in Missouri, about 80 miles west of St. Louis. And the thing that fascinated me as a teenager was that uh, uh, we raised beef calves, of course, and we grew our own feed. And the thing that fascinated me was that we would uh, grind this feed up. We'd grind up the corn and the soybeans and the hay, and uh, we'd add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals to this mix, and we'd make pellets. We'd feed those calves for about six to nine months, and we'd knock them in the head and eat them. It was a real simple cycle on the farm. And we ate out of those very same fields. We kept back five rows of corn for the family, and we had a garden at the end of the field where we grew peas and beans and tomatoes and squash, and uh, we had all these goodies growing there, peppers and potatoes and carrots and whatnot. And we didn't do those same things for ourselves, and we want to live to be 100 with no aches and pains. And I always used to ask my dad, I'd say, hey, Pops, how come we go to all this trouble for the calves, we give them vitamins and minerals and trace minerals, grind up their feet, make pellets, and we just knock them in the head after six months or so and eat them? And we want to live to be 100 with no aches and pains. And being an old Missouri farmer, he'd give me a lot of Missouri farm wisdom. He'd say things like, shut up, boy. You're getting farm fresh food, free exercise, and fresh air, and don't, don't ask complicated questions. Well, I really didn't get an answer to my question until I got into the university. My um, first uh, round of school was in ag school. My major was in animal husbandry and nutrition. My minor was in field crops and soils. And I began to learn technical things about soil, soil chemistry, and how it related to food value to animals and people, and how uh, various fertilizers uh, affected tons and bushels per acre of ground and, and yield. But I didn't get an answer to my question until I got to be a freshman veterinary student at the University of Missouri. And as a freshman veterinary student, I learned that the reason why we put all these vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds is because we don't have insurance for them. We don't have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, major medical hospitalization, Medicare, Medicaid, or even a Hillary to watch out for them. And as a result, if we were to use a human health care type of system for animals, it'd be sticker shock for everybody. Your hamburger would cost you $275 a pound, and your uh, boneless, skinless chicken breast would be $450 a pound. So we learned that we could keep the cost of, of uh, animal products, such as meat and dairy and eggs, down to the average ability for the American to purchase simply by preventing uh, all these diseases and curing diseases with nutrition, keeping the veterinary bills down. And that fascinated me. Now, after graduating vet school, I went to Africa for two years and got to um, work with uh, Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom days. And that was a great experience for a new vet out of school and uh, tromped all over Central and South Africa, catching elephants and rhinos and things like that with a tranquilizer gun. Got to play, play, uh, play Frank Buck. And after two years of doing this, Marlon sent me a telegram and invited me back to the States to work on a big project. He'd gotten $7.5 million from the National Institutes of Health and this was to study pollution and ecology, and this was some 35 years ago. And uh, nobody quite knew what it all meant, but we knew that there was contamination with pollutants in our air, water, and food. And my job as the wildlife veterinarian on the project was to do autopsies of animals that died of natural causes in the big zoos uh, to look for a species of animals that was ultra-sensitive to pollution. And we were going to use that species of animal by setting up colonies in strategic places around the United States. And they were going to act like the canary in the mine, like the old coal miners. Uh, you know, they'd take the canary down in the mine, and if methane gas or carbon monoxide would leak into the mine, they were more sensitive than the men. And they would drop off in the uh, perch and die long before the men were in danger. Well, to make a long story short, after about uh, 12 or so years of working on that project, I had done some 17,500 autopsies and over 400 54 species of animals between all these zoos I worked in, plus 3,000 human beings for a comparison. And what I learned was that every animal and every human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency disease. And that got me interested in nutrition again. And so I wrote 75 scientific papers and reviewed all the research you need to do to write the papers and contributed chapters to eight multi-author textbooks, wrote one of my own about so big. Uh, cost 140 bucks for a medical student. I'm not sure they ever read them, but they had to get them to pass the, the course. And then, um, let's see, it was on 2020 with Hugh Downs and Geraldo before he got his nose broke for the first time. And uh, <laughs> I was on all the network TVs with 1,700 newspapers, lectured all across America like this, and I couldn't get anybody interested in those findings. 
primarily because there was a lot of competition. We had just put men on the moon. We had a uh, high-tech Cold War going on with the Soviets. We had committed $23 billion to finding a cure for cancer or maybe a vaccine for cancer. And everybody said, well, you know, this nutritional stuff, that only occurs in third world countries. I mean, this is America. We've got the best food and the most food. And so I couldn't get anybody too interested. So I got frustrated. I went back to school for four years in Portland, Oregon, not too far south from here, a couple hours drive. <clears throat> and uh, uh, what I did uh, was uh, become a physician. And I practiced there for 12 years, general family practice, and delivered babies and sewed up chainsaw wounds and all the things you do, look at hemorrhoids and you know, all the fun things of life where you get real perspective. And uh, I was always very honest. I put my veterinary degree on the wall next to the medical degree. And new patients, when they would come in, for some reason would spot that veterinary degree first. They'd look at that and say, you know, Doc, I'm here for a physical. Uh, it seems like you're a vet. And I said, well, if you don't deserve a rabies shot, I won't give you one. And, <laughs> and if I saw they were from a farm, I, you know, on their intake uh, questionnaire, I always used to keep one of these full-length obstetrical gloves you wear to examine cows and horses and do artificial insemination and things like that. And they knew what it was immediately. And they'd, their eyes would get this big and they'd backstroke out of the office. And they'd never turn their back on me. It was kind of fascinating. And, of course, the nurses would have to chase them down and say, Doc, don't terrorize the patients like that. But we had a lot of fun. And uh, I think I taught the patients uh, some things. I know they taught me some things. And we're going to go over a lot of this uh, yet this afternoon. And if you take home just 10% of what I share with you, you're going to save yourselves an enormous amount of unnecessary misery. And you're going to save yourselves a gob of money, a time, and effort, and you're going to add many, many healthful years to your life. Now, the human being has the ability, the capability of living healthily to be 120 to 140. Absolutely no doubt about it. And Americans don't do a very good job. Our average lifespan is 75.5, about half of what we're genetically capable of. And if uh, you look at the other statistics, uh, we rank 17th in longevity when we're compared with the other 32 industrialized nations. There are 16 other nations whose peoples live longer than we do. We rank 19th in healthfulness. That means that uh, there's 18 other nations whose peoples live longer than we do before they um, develop heart disease and, and arthritis and cancer and high blood pressure and so forth. And we rank uh, 23rd when it comes to live births and first year survivability of our babies, and we rank dead last when it comes to preventing birth defects. And all these statistics mean that we have the highest priced healthcare system in the world. We have the most healthcare, but not the best. We have lots to learn. I'm glad to see so many people in here this afternoon because it's gonna be worthwhile for you, I believe. Now, I actually believe that I have found the early warning system that I was contracted to do when I first came back from Africa and uh, it, it's not an exotic animal like we we're looking for. It wasn't a koala bear, it wasn't a hummingbird, or maybe a rare and endangered species of reptile or fish. Our, our early warning system is twofold. Number one, it's our physicians, and it's also uh, athletes. The reason why I say it's our physicians, uh, I, I kind of looked at doctors and said, well, gosh, you know, if doctors know what they're talking about when it comes to health and longevity, if you separate them out from the main population of America, they should be healthier and live longer. I mean, that's just kind of fourth grade logic. That's pretty simple, but straightforward logic. So I separated them out and went to the medical library and looked. And sure enough, the average lifespan for a medical doctor in America is 58. And the average lifespan for the average citizen is 75.5. So you can gain 20 years statistically by not going to medical school. That blew my mind. So I started a hobby of collecting obituaries of doctors. Thus, thus the title of the uh, talk, the presentation, Dead Doctors Don't Lie. And I'm going to show you some of the reasons why doctors die so early. And of course, basically, they're a great control group for the rest of the population because 85% of the Americans supplement with vitamins or minerals or trace minerals in some combination. You know, everybody's into antioxidants or even if they just take calcium, you know, they're, they're doing something. Where doctors as a group have this stupid, malignant, dumb belief that you can get everything you need from your four food groups. And they must teach them that in school because every patient that comes to me says, well, my other doctor says I can get everything I need from my four food groups. So, this is a kind of a universal thing. They also say, oh, it just gives you expensive urine if you take vitamins and minerals. And Missouri translation of that is you're just peeing away your money <laughs> if you take vitamins and minerals. And uh, you can get everything you need from your four food. You know, they, they love that thing. At any rate, uh, a couple of my, and I apologize for not flashing these up on the screen, but I'll give them to you orally. And uh, Dr. Stuart Cartwright, uh, age 38, was a family practitioner, and he dropped dead in his home from a ruptured coronary artery aneurysm. And uh, aneurysm uh, is a breakdown of the elastic fibers in arteries. It could be in the brain or the heart or the large arteries of the body. 
and the internal pressure in the artery blows a balloon in that weakened area where the uh, elastic fibers break down, much like the mechanics of a balloon on a tire where you hit a chuck hole and break the cords. And uh, at any rate, we learned in 1957 from turkeys what causes aneurysms. Uh, the USDA came up with a pilot study with 250,000 turkeys, and they gave them a complete turkey pellet. And in the first 13 weeks, fully half of them, 125,000 of them died. Farmers were out there every morning picking them up by the bushel baskets full. They take them into the diagnostic labs to see what they died from. They opened them up, every one of them, 125,000 of them died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm. And one of the clever pathologists says, you know, that's got to be due to a uh, copper deficiency because copper is required to manufacture elastic fibers and keep them strong and healthy. So they doubled the amount of copper in those um, uh, pellets. The next year they tried to ri raise 500,000 turkeys and they didn't lose a single one of them from a ruptured aneurysm. So they got very excited. And in 1958 they began to look at copper deficient diets in human beings and various species of animals to see if it had anything to do with um, aneurysms. What they found out was the first symptom, the very first symptom of a copper deficiency in human beings is white, gray, or silver hair. And I see a lot of copper deficiency in this room. And of course what happens is if you don't pay attention to this early warning, boom, you drop dead from a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, just like you've been shot through the head or the heart or the major arteries of the body. And if you don't pay attention to that warning, what's going to happen is you'll be like Frank, you know, who dies suddenly and all his friends get together at Denny's after the funeral. You know, they're all in their glad rags and they're having this uh, little soiree there and eating their whatever they eat at Denny's and, and uh, saying, you know, we never thought Frank would have been the first one to go. I mean, this guy was Mr. Fitness. Uh, he walked five miles every day. He did aerobics three afternoons a week with the young people. He ripped the chicken skin off the chicken before he ate it. I mean, this guy ate salads. He was a vegetarian, all that kind of stuff. And he always looked so distinguished in his gray hair. See, he'd been worn for 20 years. But nobody told him that he was going to die of a ruptured aneurysm if he didn't deal with that gray hair. Another one of my favorites is uh, Dr. Martin Carter, age 57, one year before the average for physicians. He was an expert, according to the New York Times obituaries. He had every drop of medical education you can get in the whole world. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree, his pre-med, from Dartmouth. You can't say the R's up in New England. From Dartmouth College, and he received his MD from Harvard up in Boston, and his PhD degree in medicine from Yale. He had every drop of education, medical education you can want in the whole world, but he didn't have expensive urine because the cause of death was a ruptured aortic aneurysm, just like those copper-deficient turkeys. Now, one of my mother's favorite obituaries is uh, Dr. Gail Clark. Uh, she was the chief cardiologist of her hospital, age 47. She's walking down the halls of her own hospital. She's got her stethoscope. They always have their stethoscope now. You know. Hi, I'm Dr. Gail Clark. I'm the chief cardiologist of this hospital. Here's my stethoscope. Boom! She drops dead of a cardiomyopathy heart attack right in the halls of her own hospital. This is a selenium deficiency. It's caused by a deficiency of the trace mineral selenium. And they try to save her. They try to save her, you know, by giving her all this uh, paddles, you know, with the electric shock to get the heart going again. And of course, it's too late because she had a, you can't uh, fix a selenium deficiency with electricity. It just doesn't work that way, uh, no matter how many years of college she had. And it didn't work. And finally, you hear this uh, uh, flat line when you know the heart's dead. And let's see a heart patient next door to this treatment room, and you hear all this, and your, your own monitor is going beep, 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 because you're nervous with all this activity next door and screaming for code carts and everything. And you say, nurse, nurse, what, what went on next door? It was horrible with all those screams and everything. And the nurse says, well, you know, your cardiologist, the chief cardiologist of this hospital, Dr. Gail Clark, age 47, she just croaked next door from a cardiomyopathy heart attack, uh, a simple selenium deficiency disease. And you see all the patients holding their gowns, and they're running out of the hospital. <laughs> as fast as they could go because whatever the chief got, they don't want. <laughs> Another one, of course, and this one I think you'll have fun with. I've got to tell you a quick story here. Um, I don't want you to think ill of me before I share this with you. Uh, one of the famous trial attorneys from the 1920s was Clarence Darrow. He was made famous during the Scopes Monkey Trial thing in Tennessee. And uh, the prosecutor who always fought him tooth and tongue in court was another, another famous orator, William Jennings Bryant. And about a week after that trial, which William Jennings Bryant won, the prosecution won, he dropped dead. And all the press and reporters and media ran to Clarence Darrow and said, hey, he must have really been hard on him in this last trial. Uh, he dropped dead immediately after this trial. And Clarence Darrow knew this was the last shot he was going to get to take a dig at his old courtroom enemy. And he knew that if he died first, William Jennings Bryant was going to take a gig at him, right? So he thought for a minute, and this is a very famous quote, he said, quote, 
Oh, I hate to see anybody die, but there have been a few obituaries I've enjoyed reading, <laughs> unquote. That's how I feel about this guy, Dr. Thomas Beam, age 48, 10 years before the average death age uh, for physicians, uh, 30 years before the average age of death for an average American, was an expert, according to the New York Times obituaries, died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple selenium deficiency disease. And not only was he an expert, he was an FDA expert. Why would you want to listen to anything the FDA had to say about health and nutrition when their experts die of a nutritional deficiency disease at age 48? Now, one of the things you'd like to see happen is that doctors who win the Nobel Prize for medicine, they should at least live to be the average age for the average American, right? You'd like to think they'd live to be the average age. I mean, these guys are supposed to be the whiz kids of medicine when they win the Nobel Prize in medicine. Now, the youngest guy to ever win the Nobel Prize in medicine was a fellow by the name of George Kohler. K-O-H-L-E-R, age 37, won the Nobel Prize in medicine. This guy was supposed to be the medical genius of the 20th century. 11 years later, at age 48, boom, drops dead of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple selenium deficiency disease, because he didn't want to have expensive urine. Remember, they're a control group. They refuse to take vitamins and minerals because they don't want expensive urine. Well, let's look at athletes for a minute, some of which are medical doctors. The CDC, Center for Disease Control, says that 100,000 young athletes between the ages of 13 and 30 drop dead every year, either during exercise, during a sporting event, or immediately after. 100,000 a year, that's double what we lose in car accidents. And look at all the things they do for car safety. Seat belts, airbags, all this research, and they blow up a whole bunch of Volvos, you know, it's crashing into walls and all these things, spend millions of dollars doing this for car safety. And doctors are saying, exercise is good for you, and 100,000 twice that die every year, and nobody knows why. Well, I'm glad you're here because I'm going to share with you why. About 10 years ago, I began to see scientific articles in medical journals on this sudden death in young athletes. And it said that 30% um, of them, about 30, 35% of them, died of ruptured aneurysms. Even though they're 13 years old, they die of a ruptured aneurysm. What do they die from? A copper deficiency. The other 65% died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. What do they die from? A selenium deficiency. Now, one of, one of the most famous... Uh, athletes, oh, I have to tell you one other story, you'll appreciate this. The Russian lifespan has dropped in the last four years from 64, that was their average lifespan, 64, to 57. That's a seven year drop in four years for a whole nation. Not a 0.1% drop, but an 11% drop. You know how many millions of people under the age of 64 had to die to bring the whole nation's lifespan down 11%? This is a real concern. I'll give you a quote here because I can't show it to you on the screen, so I'll say, this is a quote, there's no historical precedent <clears throat> for this anywhere in the world, said Judith Shapiro, an economist who specializes in health demographics at the University of London, referring to this drastic drop in Russian lifespan from 64 to 57 in the last four years. Obviously, nobody can quite figure it out. It's a mystery that must be solved immediately, unquote, because the people who are dying between age 35 and 50 are all the highly skilled people. These are all the trained people. And what's going to happen is they're going to have a huge void of trained people if they keep dying like this. So everybody's scared what's going on in Russia. I want you to think, what have the Russians eaten in the last 25 years? American wheat. We sent them all the wheat from the wheat deals. Now, it's my belief that the reason they're all dying is they don't have any selenium in American wheat because the soils are deficient. And we grew lots of tons in bushels, but nobody paid attention to what was in it. And Americans take vitamins and minerals. 85% of Americans take vitamins and minerals, and doctors don't. That's why they die at 58, and Russians don't. That's why they're dying at 54, okay? And Russia is what we would look like if we didn't supplement. Our average lifespan would drop from 75.5 to 54. Pretty scary. Now, athletes, the first symptom that they get when they're running out of minerals, like selenium and, and uh, copper, is they get what's called the staleness syndrome. Yeah, they get kind of wore out and burned out, and you know, say, I'm burned out. I, I don't want to work out anymore. I don't want to train anymore. And they just get the blahs. They don't recover. And they, uh, they may have their very best two years ago and they can't quite get to their very best anymore. That's the first symptom that things are beginning to go wrong. And then a, a very famous guy, <clears throat> Reggie Lewis, who was the 27-year-old captain of the Boston Celtics in April of 1993, collapsed during the playoff game with the Charlotte Hornets. And he was diagnosed very quickly and very uh, effectively and very uh, quite accurately as having cardiomyopathy heart disease had a heart attack at age 27. He was a $65 million contract basketball player for the Boston Celtics. So they hired the top 12 cardiologists in the whole world. They referred 
all of the uh, uh, patients that they had, other doctors, and they were supposed to devote their whole time to saving Reggie. And they were called the dream team of cardiologists, the dream team of cardiologists. Now, if they would have taken 50 bucks and given it to a medical student and said, hey, go to the medical library and ask the computer, like Star Trek, computer, what are all the known causes of cardiomyopathy? This is what the computer would have said. There's only one known cause of cardiomyopathy. It was discovered in animals in 1957. It was proven in human beings in 1972 in a double-blind crossover study with 45,000 human subjects. 45,000 human subjects. And the results of this was published in every medical journal in the world no less than six times. We're not talking about some remote Pakistani medical journal in some weird province somewhere. We're talking every medical journal in the world no less than six times. The only known cause of cardiomyopathy heart disease is a selenium deficiency. Now, one of these guys, the members of the dream team of cardiologists, gave Reggie Lewis 10 cents worth of selenium. They were all arguing and bickering. Some of you may remember this on CNN News. They had these big conference tables. Well, should we give them drugs? Do we need to install a pacemaker? Well, maybe we need to do a heart transplant for $750,000 and get famous and this kind of thing. And three months later, because nobody gave Reggie any selenium, he dropped dead of a second cardiomyopathy heart attack at age uh, 27, July 28, 1993. Now, justice has a way of coming around if you wait long enough, just like with the Weaver family. Okay? Justice has a way of coming around. Of course, they'll never bring Vicki or, or their boy back, but justice has a way of coming around. And with Reggie Lewis, justice came around a year and a half after he died. The chief, the director of the Dream Team of Cardiology, Dr. W. Thomas Ness, a cardiologist who worked with the Boston Celtics at age 48, dropped dead in his own home from cardiomyopathy, the same disease. Boom! Just dropped dead. Why would you want to believe anything that these top cardiologists had when the member, when the chief of the dream team of cardiologists drops dead of a cardiomyopathy heart attack at age 48? That's one of my favorite obituaries. That one I have framed on, on my wall in my office. I mean, this obituary is so big, it took up one half the page in the Boston Globe has his picture on it, you know, a very distinguished a medical picture of this million dollar autopsy, right? I'd have just bought one of these five dollar classified ads and said, Tom died. That's all you got from me. <laughs> now, good things do happen when you take minerals. Evander Holyfield, two-time heavyweight boxing champion, uh, was banned from the boxing world two years ago because he developed cardiomyopathy, not the sudden type of heart attack, but a slow wasting, a slow uh, muscular dystrophy of the heart muscle. Couldn't pass the Boxing Commission electrocardiogram, banned from boxing. A year ago, I got to talk with his physician in Atlanta when I was visiting there, and uh, as a result of that, his physician began to give him some selenium. Seven months later, he passes the uh, Boxing Commission's electrocardiogram he went back in the ring a month and a half ago, and he won his first fight back in the ring after two years. He's scheduled to box again this November. So there are good things that happen, no matter how far down you are, if you take um, the right nutrients. Now here's one. You can't see it, but this is an obituary for Dr. Michael P. Ortiz, a medical doctor, age 38, who collapsed and died while jogging of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple selenium deficiency disease. I'm glad to see these doctors dying during exercise because it's something I prescribed for everybody and died at age 38. Um, doing this wondrous thing that they prescribe for everyone. Let's see here. Buster Douglas, another uh, heavyweight champion uh, who lost his championship to Evander Holyfield, I believe, a little over two years ago. Two years after he lost the championship, he developed brittle diabetes. He, he developed adult onset diabetes, which we know is a deficiency of chromium and vanadium, two trace minerals. And we'll talk about that more in detail in a minute. Then, if you look at brain cancer, the rate of brain cancer in America has gone up 700% in the last 40 years. And everybody's blaming cellular telephones. Ah, some cellular telephones. You know, they hold that stuff up against their head. I can tell you from, I'm a pathologist as well as a clinician, so I look at the statistics. Believe me, if there was any remote possibility it was caused by the cellular telephone, the FDA would have it off the market. I mean, they take even amino acids and, and vitamins off the market if they could. So 97% of the people with brain cancer have never, ever even been in the same room with a cellular telephone, let alone use one on a regular basis. So that's kind of nonsensical. But we do know from laboratory animals that if you give a laboratory animal a deficiency of a trace mineral called gallium, G-A-L-L-I-U-M, you know, they will have a high rate of brain cancer. And if you supplement them with gallium in their diet and then give them chemicals known to cause brain cancer, they won't get brain cancer. Think about the athletes. Think about the athletes who died of brain cancer in the last couple of years. The very famous ones. There's thousands of them. They're not so famous. 
high school kids, college kids, and so forth, and not so famous pros and semi pros, but three famous people Lyle Alzado, big middle linebacker for the uh, Oakland Raiders, died of brain cancer about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And then um, Fred LeBeau, the founder of the New York Marathon, a world class marathon runner for many, many years, died at age 56 from a brain cancer. And then Wilma Rudolph in November of last year, just about 10 months ago, uh, died at age 54. The first woman to ever uh, win three gold medals in the Olympics in track and field. Died at age 54, brain cancer. Lastly, on this uh, subject, before we change pace here a little bit, a study showed that 62% of all female college gymnasts suffer from anorexia. Is that because 62% of these gymnast mothers hate them or they think they're fat? No. What it is, and, and I used to see a lot of these up in Portland because uh, when I practiced there, this was the time of Olga Corbett, you know, the first female to win all gymnastic events with a perfect score. So every parent wanted their little girl to be Olga Corbett. You know, she was the darling of the world. So all these gymnastic training centers popped up all over the country, and uh, Portland was no exception. So I'd see lots of them. And, of course, they had the usual bruises and sprains and twists and so forth. But the thing that fascinated me was I saw so many of them with anorexia. And I started doing hair analysis on them, and I found out that all of these... Um, um, little gymnast with anorexia had very severe deficiencies of zinc in their hair analysis. So I gave them a lot of minerals, including copper and selenium and magnesium and manganese and calcium and copper and zinc, in their IVs three times a week. And within 10 to 14 days, they got over their anorexia. They began to eat like little pigs and want to go back and work and were just fit and ready to go. And all the parents who took their little girls to counselors and shrinks were counseled unto death. All these little girls were counseled unto death, just like Karen Carpenter. Remember Karen Carpenter? Had all the money in the world, she and her brother, and they went around the world looking for a shrink or a counselor who could help her with her anorexia, but they counseled her unto death because nobody gave her any zinc or any other minerals. Well, what could possibly be the common denominator between a 65-pound gymnast, a 250-pound heavyweight boxing champion, a 300-pound football player, seven foot tall basketball players, and all these slim, trim, fit runners, what could possibly be a common denominator? Well, they all sweat. And when they sweat, they don't just sweat out potassium, like doctors would have you believe. They sweat out all 60 essential minerals. All 60 essential minerals. And if you sweat out all of your selenium and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of dying of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. If you sweat out all of your copper and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of dying of a ruptured aneurysm somewhere in your body. If you sweat out all of your gallium and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of dying of brain cancer. You sweat out all of your chromium and vanadium, you're at high risk of developing diabetes. And you're a teenage girl and you sweat out all of your zinc, you have a 62%, an actual statistic, 62% risk of developing anorexia and dying. Now, athletes aren't the only ones that sweat, but they're, they're telling us something here. A postmenopausal woman sweats at night until you can wring water out of the streets. A farmer throwing bales of hay up on the wagon in a July or August hot day or early September Indian summer sweats. What about a welder in a tin roof shed out there sweating? You know, they tie these bandanas around their neck to kind of catch some of the sweat around their head. It doesn't matter why you sweat. You work in a bakery, you sweat, you sweat out all of your minerals. And if you don't take them back in, boom! Just like everybody else, just like these athletes, just like the doctors. And don't put yourself in that position. Well, I could go on and on with, I've got a five-hour lecture here, but I'm going to shorten it so that we can get through it. Um, I want to quickly look at just a couple of minerals in some detail. Uh, number one, let's look at uh, calcium. Everybody knows about osteoporosis and calcium. It's the number 10 killer of adults in the United States. 75% of the people over the age of 65 don't last 90 days if they fracture a hip or a major leg bone. A very famous one just recently, Ava Gabor was 74 years old, fracture a hip, Three days later, she was dead from pneumonia. And I guarantee you, she had the very best estrogen patch that a doctor could prescribe, right? She still died of pneumonia. Cost-wise, it's horrendous. Terrible, tragic cost and a misery for people. Cost $35,000 to have each hip replaced. $70,000 if you get them both replaced. Yet we don't have osteoporosis in animals. That's because farmers have common sense. Let's say you have 100 head of cows out here and um, no calves this year. Farmer lost a lot of money. Can't... Uh, uh, repay his operating loan. So what he does, he's called the vet out and he says, Doc, uh, do I get rid of this herd? I lost a lot of money this year. Can't repay the operating loan because I didn't have any calves. And uh, the vet examines the cows. He says, well, your cows are okay, but your bull over there has osteoporosis of his hips. Can't uh, breed the cows. Too much pain. He didn't have any calves. 
He said, I'll tell you what, you give me $70,000, next year you'll have some calves. I'll give that bull two new hips. The farmer, being a practical guy, says, no, wait a minute, Doc, stand over here. Boom! And he blows the bull away. And while the kids are grinding the bull up into hamburger and cutting roast and steaks off the bull, the farmer says, now, Doc, for $70,000, I can get a new bull every year for 70 years. I wouldn't have spent that kind of money on that old bull. But every once in a while, I get one I'd like to keep because it um, throws good calves. So the farmer says, I'll tell you what. What can I do to prevent this? And the vet says, well, if you give him 10 cents worth of calcium in his pallets after you wean him. He said, well, you mean all I have to do is give up a half a cup of coffee and I can prevent a $70,000 vet bill? And he says, well, yeah. He says, well, I'm going to do that since I don't have insurance. I don't have Blue Cross Blue Shield major medical hospitalization or Medicare or Medicaid or Hillary to watch after that bull. So as a result, um, I have to pay for this myself. I'm going to do the 10 cent a day thing. That's why we don't have osteoporosis in animals. Receding gums. Dentists will tie to floss and brush after every meal. If you believe that works to prevent and cure receding gums, I have some oceanfront property in Utah to um, sell you because, of course, uh, you're an easy sell. I'm a veterinarian as well as a physician. And I've seen hundreds of thousands of animals, mice, rats, rabbits, um, horses, cows, chickens, uh, lions, tigers. Have you ever seen a chicken with receding gums? <laughs> lions and tigers and bears. And uh, they don't get receding gums and they don't floss. They do get funky breath. <laughs> now, the reason why we don't have uh, receding gums in animals is because we've taken care of the osteoporosis problem. Receding gums, gingivitis, pyorrhea, periodontitis, loose teeth, uh, plates, and bridges are all different symptoms of osteoporosis of the facial bones and the jaw bones. You can see this 20 to 50 years, 20 to 50 years before uh, you actually uh, see osteoporosis in the large bones of your legs and arms. I've seen so many patients come to me and their teeth are kind of loose, flapping around in the breeze, you know, their gums are all receded, and, and they're just wizened up here with osteoporosis and arthritis. And I say, well, dear, do you have, and I know the answer, I just want to see what they say. Do you have osteoporosis? They say, oh, no, I went to an orthopedic surgeon, and he did a CAT scan, and he says, I don't have osteoporosis or arthritis. You see, 20 years before they can see it on an X-ray or a CAT scan on the long bones of the arms and legs, you can see it because that little millimeter of bone around the uh, tooth root disappeared. Uh, let's see. Cramps and twitches. How many of you have ever had a foot or toe cramp? Raise your hand. Be honest. Okay. That, you're calcium deficient. How many of you ever had an eyelid twitch or a twitch in your muscles somewhere in your body? That's a calcium deficiency, you see. When I was 14 years old, my eyelids used to twitch so bad I could hear them click. And I'd look in the mirror and say, do people see that or is that just my imagination? And, of course, finally one day I caught it and said, Mom, look at this. She didn't know what it was. And so we got in the car and we drove 80 miles to St. Louis to see an uh, eye doctor, a woman eye doctor by the name of Mary Jane Skeffington. And I didn't know this, but back then, uh, she had me stripped down to my jockey underwear. I was 14 years old. She had me stripped down to my jockey underwear. Today, I could get on Oprah you know, and say, hey, my eye doctor sexually harassed me. But back then, I was just a dumb farm kid. I, you know, I didn't know that didn't go along with the eyes. And uh, she kept looking at my eyes, and then she'd trudge down and see another patient. She'd come back, she'd look in my eyes, get this big smile on her face, go back and look at her. And then finally, I said, Doc, you know, I'm, I, I play football. I'm on the junior varsity team, and I'm the captain of the wrestling team. I'm on the weightlifting team. Uh, is there any way we can get on with this? I've got to get back and train. And she says, well, just a minute. She went to her office. She came back, and she had a little um, uh, Maybelline mascara eyelash brush and a little mirror. I said, what's that for? She said, well, your eyes seem to be okay. The structure of your eyes is okay, but you have long eyelashes, and um, they hit your glasses, curl back, and tickle your eyeballs. That's what makes your eyelids twitch. I said, well, what are we going to do about it? She said, well, and she starts demonstrating to me. What I want you to do is every hour I want you to alternate eyes, and I want you to retrain your eyelashes. She's demonstrating with his little mascara brush. And I said, wait a minute. You want me to sit on the football bench with 25 guys weighing over 200 pounds? This is 1952. And we'd be playing with my eyelashes with a Maybelline mascara eyelash brush? brush? You've got to be kidding me. They're going to file their cleats sharp, and my own team's going to kill me. Right? So, so I put on my pants, and I went marching off to the school library, and I found in the library a health book written by a couple of nurses. And sure enough, in the index, they said um, uh, muscle cramps, muscle twitches. Guess what? It's caused by a calcium deficiency. Now, I'm, I'm 14 years old. The only place I knew we had calcium was in those calf pellets in the barn. So I ran to the barn. I stuffed all my pockets full of calf pellets. And the next day in school, while well, everybody else is eating M&Ms, I was eating handfuls of calf pellets. And sure enough, in three days, all of the um, cramps and twitches went away. And I knew the doctors didn't know anything about health and nutrition uh, when I was 14 years old. And I, I had some clue that um, eye doctors had a problem with anatomy.
Okay, lastly, if I've convinced you that minerals are important, and we've just given you a very brief peek, you know, this is normally a five-hour lecture, and we're doing this in 45 minutes here. Um, if I've convinced you that minerals are important, there's three things you need to know about minerals. Number one, there's three types of uh, minerals, mineral supplements. One of the oldest types of mineral supplements goes back to uh, literally thousands of years ago. People used to have wars over clay deposits so pregnant women could eat clay and so forth. And uh, the reason why there's no trees on the uh, British Isles is because they constantly boiled seawater to get the, the salt and the trace minerals uh, and they burned all of the forests that was on the British Isles, keeping those fires going, just burning salt water to um, uh, evaporate the water and get the minerals. And we're talking about tums, seabed minerals, we're talking about uh, clay, um, we're talking about uh, minerals from the Great Salt Lake in the ocean, we're talking about uh, oyster shell, egg shell, we're talking about uh, oh, limestone, oxides, lactates, gluconates, citrates, sulfates. These are all elemental or metallic minerals. And you can only absorb about 8 to 12 percent when you're under 40 years of age. And then <clears throat> when you hit the big 4-0, have you ever wondered why everybody hits that wall and kindly everything falls apart? You know, your blood pressure goes up, your blood sugar goes up, your hair falls out and gets gray, and your teeth get loose. That's because your ability to absorb minerals of this type drops precipitously from 8 to 12 percent down to 3 to 5 percent. Suddenly everything goes wrong. <clears throat> and about two years ago, I was up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and this guy jumps up in the back of the room and he says, Hey, Doc, now I know what I see in my porta potty business. So what do you see in your porta potty business? He says, Well, when we clean those things out and disinfect them to use them again, we find hundreds and hundreds of vitamin pills in there that come through people. I said, Well, how do you know they're vitamin pills? He says, Oh, that's easy. They say Theragram M, one a day, Centrum, and Centrum Silver right on the coating. So next time you're on the pot and you hear clink, clink, plop, plop, you know what it is coming through. Now, a lot of people say, Doc, uh, I've been using 2,000 milligrams of calcium every day for 20 years and I still have insomnia, foot cramps, muscle twitches, high blood pressure, arthritis, osteoporosis, loose teeth, everything you can think of associated with calcium deficiency. Are, are you really telling me the truth here? They say, well, yeah, what kind you take? And they say, well, I take calcium lactate, a, a elemental type of, of mineral. And they say, well, the problem is out of a 1,000 milligram calcium lactate tablet, 860 milligrams, 86% is lactose or milk sugar. Only 14% is this metallic or elemental calcium. Let's use an easy number for math here since I don't have the screen. Let's take 10%. 10% of, of 140 milligrams of the elemental calcium in there is 14 milligrams. Two times 14 is not 2,000 milligrams, but 28 milligrams. You get 2,000 milligrams of usable elemental calcium from a 1,000 milligram calcium lactate tablet. You have to take 30 of those with each meal. You have to take 90 a day. And it's going to cost you 150 bucks a month for the cheapest source of this calcium lactate. And you just have used one mineral. You, ha you still have 59 more essential minerals to go. And you're also going to develop what I call BNF, which is a type of uh, a physician-caused disease. It stands for belching and farting, BNF disease. And you sound like an elephant out in the woods with this terrible gastric problem. And you know you have it when your spouse throws a canary in the bathroom to see if it's safe to go in there. I can always tell who has BNF disease. <laughs> He's saying, not me, not me. <laughs> okay. Now, during the 60s, the agricultural industry came up with uh, chelated minerals because a farmer is not dumb enough to put a dollar in an animal's mouth and have 99 cents come out in the manure. So they added uh, amino acids, proteins, and enzymes, which are proteins that do work, and that increased the absorbability of these uh, elemental minerals from 3 to 5% to 40% for livestock. And the health food industry recognized this as something beneficial. So after the 60s, you began to see chelated minerals mixed into multiple vitamin and mineral supplements along with the elemental minerals. But it was the agricultural industry who figured this out. Now, the way that animals and people are designed to get minerals is in the colloidal farm. These are from plants. We're supposed to get our minerals from eating plants, you know, our grains, fruits, and vegetables, and nuts. We're not supposed to get our minerals from eating ground up rocks and dirt and soil and clay and things like that. And, of course, colloidal minerals are liquid in size, small particle size, 7,000 times smaller than a red blood cell. They're negatively charged, and your intestinal lining is positively charged. You actually get an a electrical gradient that uh, um, concentrates these things along the intestinal lining. These three factors together actually uh, result in this 98% absorbability. Two and a half times more absorbable than chelated, ten times more absorbable than metallic, and again, the way it's supposed to happen, our food plants are supposed to take the metallic minerals out of the soil, convert them to colloidal minerals for their own use, have a little bit left over, we consume the plants and get our minerals. Unfortunately, there's a document, U.S. Senate Document 264, that says there's no longer any nutritional minerals left in our farm rain soils. 
There's no longer any nutritional minerals left in our farm and range cells. U.S. Senate Document 264. Now, the scary thing about U.S. Senate Document 264 was written and published by the U.S. Senate in 1936. 59 years ago, this was known. In a couple of months, it'll be 60 years old, this document. Have you heard any government person or, or a doctor or somebody yelling about this? No. And so I'm glad to be able to tell you about it. Now, there's no less than six cultures on Earth who are featured in two things. Number one, Chapter 8 of Rare Earths, Forbidden Cures, one of the two books my wife and I have written. And then also in the January 1973 issue of the National Geographic, a special that was done on uh, uh, cultures who lived to be over 100, 120, 140. And these people who lived to be 120 to 140 without developing uh, diabetes and cancer and heart disease and high blood pressure and arthritis and diabetes and, and osteoporosis and loose teeth and cataracts and glaucoma and they don't have birth defects and they don't have jails full of criminals, violent criminals or um, uh, people who are on drugs and things like that. These people have a certain common denominator and they all get their water for drinking, cooking and irrigation from glacial milk. You take a glass full of this glacial milk, it looks like whole milk. That's why they call it glacial milk. It has 60 to 72 minerals in it. Not that they thought about it, it was just a, a matter of chance 2,500 to 5,000 years ago when they set their cultures up in these areas. You boil away a quart of glacial milk, you get two inches of these suspended minerals in the bottom of that jug. Boil away a quart of Perrier or Evian water, you get as much mineral as you can get on the head of a pin. That's how much difference there is. Now, we put in NPK, 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 simple three nutrient fertilizer for 25 bucks an acre. It gives the farmer the maximum yield in terms of tons and bushels per acre. The Hunzas, the Tibetans, the um, uh, Russian Georgians, Azerbaijanis, Abkhazians, Vilcabambas, and Titicacas, these people have been irrigating with glacial milk for 2,500 to, to 5,000 years. Crop after crop, year after year, generation after generation. We put back in NPK, NPK. As a result, they don't have any of these diseases. They don't have any of these degenerative diseases that kill Americans long, long before our genetic potential for longevity.